Lao Tzu and I think Jesus would agree, within our time of meditation, there is a space for thinking, but there's also a space for just listening. Meditation and worship is really listening to the still small voice within ourselves. So I have the privilege of teaching Chinese philosophy at the University of Nevada. And when I get together with my students, I tell them this is really a game show. And uh, door number one in the game show is fear, anger, and anxiety. And door number two is love, joy, and peace. And I tell them that we are going to take a journey through the semester, and I'm going to teach you some techniques and some ways in which to migrate from door number one to door number two. And door number two is really your birthright. It is, as we know from the Arantia book, the fruits of the spirit. And uh, you've been swindled. Um, and the swindle is that you don't know that's your birthright, right. love, joy, and peace. So we're going to launch, and I encourage you to uh, fasten your seatbelt because we're going to move reasonably quickly. So we begin with a picture familiar to many of you, um, which is that of Jesus smiling. And again, what we understand from the Arantia Revelation is that he indeed was a person who dwelt in door number two, and he manifested those qualities of love, joy, and peace in everything he thought and said and did. And so I love this picture by Greg Olson. And what we're going to compare Jesus to is a fellow named Lao Tzu. And Lao Tzu means the old boy. And the teachings of Lao Tzu are, are pretty basic, pretty simple, as are the teachings of Jesus. And we talk about the way and its virtue when we talk about Lao Tzu. So I'm beginning with the appreciation of the way and the virtue of Jesus. Lao Tzu means literally old boy. And um, I'm often reminded of Bob Dylan's song, um, Back Pages. Uh, sung by the birds. I was so much older then, I'm younger than that now. now. And I hope that many of you on the screen share that experience. Um, the older I get, I think it's a Benjamin Buttons kind of experience, but the older I get, the younger I feel. And uh, the qualities of joy and the qualities of awe that have emerged over the last uh, quarter of a century have been nothing short of spectacular. And so Lao Tzu teaches us, again, the way and its virtue. Tao means the way, and day, and this is, they, they pronounce it with a D, and that's why I get paid the big bucks, because uh, this is English scholars who wanted to confuse everybody, but they wrote it with a T, and they pronounced it with a D, and so there you go. So <laughs> hang in there with me. So we, I begin every class with the greeting of Nin Hao. Nin Hao means greetings welcome. And uh, it's been a great privilege. I've been working with a class of Taiwanese and Chinese students over the last uh, couple of years. And we've been studying lots of different things, but I've really come to appreciate uh, Chinese culture um, in a deep and, and meaningful way. So his book, The Tao Te Ching, again, just means the way and its virtue. Uh, Ching means book. Um, and there are, in fact, only three principles that one needs to sort of understand in Taoism. The first is the principle of the Tao. The second is the principle of day or virtue. And the third is what we call Wei Wu Wei, which means the action of non-action, or what we will call the path of least resistance. Uh, as some of you may know, the Tao Te Ching is the second most translated uh, text on the planet next to the Bible. There are over 250 translations. And the one we're going to be looking at from paper 131 um, is a, a good translation. It's a translation that was well done in for its time. But there are better translations, in my opinion, now. Um, and what I want to say is that this 
uh, text that we get in paper 131 is uh, a text that was translated uh, late 19th, early 20th century. So it's not exactly the words that Jesus and Gained were reading while they were in Alexandria in paper 131, but, but it is very, very close. So if you read many translations as I have, you'll see that there's a real proximity. Um, part of why I am really pleased to present this is because I think one of the least read papers in the book is paper 131. And I've been involved in interfaith work since the 70s. And what I will tell you is it's like learning another language. So there's a little bit of work to be done, but like learning another language, it amplifies your language of origin. And so the appreciation of the revelation has only been amplified as a result of my appreciation of other faith traditions. Um, and we can talk about that later. So in Chinese philosophy, the goal is, uh, and the realization is that we are all in potential what we call shenses or sages, and that we all have, if you will, as our path, a quest for perfection. And it involves following the will of Tao. Sound familiar? <laughs> we, we get uh, this teaching in the Urantia Revelation and Indeed, it's a powerful teaching. Uh, Jesus viewed the kingdom as nothing more nor less than the will of God. So I began the class again with the teaching of the wise men, the blind wise men, and the elephant. And you probably all heard the story, so I won't repeat it too much, other than to say that a bunch of wise men who were blind were asked by the blind king to interpret the reality, the great reality of an elephant. And the one in the back said, oh, I know what an elephant is. It's like a rope, uh, but it's really kind of smelly. And so you don't want to touch it too long. And the one in the front said, no, 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 no. I know what an elephant is. It's like a hose, but I don't recommend the water out of the nostril, out of the hose, because it's, it's kind of yucky. But what we, what we appreciate, um, not only from Taoism, but also from the Revelation, is that what we're attempting to do is to garner uh, an appreciation of all the parts from the vantage point of the whole. And that requires us to become contemplatives. That requires us to, to, to take a divine appointment every day and to immerse ourselves in the spirit of God that indwells each of our hearts. And it is a divine appointment. And it is a situation, as the book says, God desires communion with all of his creatures, where again, if he were knocking on your door, would you say no to 20 minutes of just sitting in quiet silence and adoration and worship and meditation with, with God, the creator? Hmm. So the point of view of the whole, the Tao, right? is what, what Lao Tzu is inviting us to. And the Tao Te Ching is a, a text which was written on the fly. Uh, Lao Tzu lived during a period in China where there was a great amount of warfare, a lot of violence, uh, and that was 2,500 years ago. And guess what? Things haven't changed much. Um, and so he was a librarian. He packed up his ox cart and he headed out of Dodge. Uh, he wanted to get away from the violence. He wanted to get some peace and quiet in his elderly years. And while he was traveling, he reached the frontier gate. And thank goodness for us, the uh, gatekeeper said, would you mind having a little bit of tea here and sharing or writing down a few thoughts? And so he wrote 5,000 characters, uh, which is the alphabet in, in China. And those 5,000 characters have become the Tao Te Ching. Lao Tzu never anticipated that there would be a Taoism, that there would be priests, that there would be rituals, that there would be all these things now associated with uh, Taoism. But sure enough, we humans have a, a lovely way of idolizing um, things that we probably shouldn't and which create greater confusion. So Lao Tzu says something I think really important. So this is one of the primary things I want to share with you. When a person lacks a sense of awe, there will be disaster. And so there 
uh, is his saying, and there's Jesus and the disciples looking across the Sea of Galilee at the sun, probably setting, and um, and feeling that sense of awe. And what the Arantia book invites us to, and what the Tao Te Ching invites us to, is a contemplative experience of awe, where we sense the wonder of being a living being, of being a, a man or a woman, of living in this moment in time with these few years and with the great opportunities that each of us carry, the great potentials, and the recognition that, as Thomas Merton says, each of us are great beyond any imagination. And he said, I suppose the real problem would be if we could see into each other's heart, we would fall down and worship each other. So again, we each have this incredible gift, which as I tell my students, only you can deliver to the world. So a friend of mine, Dr. Keltner, who runs the Greater Good Science Center in Berkeley, UC Berkeley, has written a new book, which I recommend to you called Awe. And he writes in there, awe is about our relation to the vast mysteries of life. And then I add, it involves connecting the heart to the mind. And there's a fascinating word in Chinese, xin, from which we get the word China. And it means heart-mind. And it's only recently, in the last 30, 40 years, that neuroscience has recognized that the heart indeed is connected to the mind and that the heart is more than just a blood pumping mechanism. It carries memory, it carries um, hormones, it carries a magnetic resonance five times greater than that of the brain. And the fascinating part of that word shin is it also is the word for trust. And so what I observe in my classes is that my students have lost trust in our institutions. They have lost trust in religion. There's very, I always ask the question at the beginning, how many of you trust the universe? And yeah, one hand maybe sort of, sort of goes up, uh, but most of them, no, they do not trust the universe. And most of them feel um, alienated. And again, my challenge and my joy is to try to get that sparkle back in their eye and to get them with a sense of trust for the world around them. But the gateway to that is awe. And so we always say that the first chapter in any text is really key to understanding the whole text. And it is in chapter one that Lao Tzu says, how deep and mysterious is the unity of the Tao, how profound, how great. It is the truth beyond the truth, the hidden within the hidden. It is the way to all awe the gate to the essence of everything. And so again, the Tao Te Ching, even though he didn't anticipate it, that we'd be reading it today, 2,500 years later, is an invitation to an experience of awe, to a contemplative dimension of our life. And this is in fact, and in truth, exactly what Jesus does in his teachings. So I share with my students as we go through that story of 13.7 billion years, which is the cosmology of the world today, as you all know, different than the Arantia book cosmology, that there are three core principles which are uh, illustrated and enumerated in caps uh, in the Arantia book, unity, diversity, and growth, progress, evolution. And then I tell them there are three core values associated with those principles living love, compassion, and hope. And then I tell them that the Bill of Rights of the universe is as follows, the right to be, the right to belong, and the right to become. And I share with them um, this quote, which I believe is true, that compassion is the linchpin between love and hope. And so many of my students have lost hope. So we always say uh, in that first chapter that um, it's kind of like the Surgeon General's warning on a pack of cigarettes, um, that there's Lao Tzu's giving you uh, a, a warning when you're reading this text, and that is not to become too attached and not to confuse yourself with the language and the words. And so he says, 
So a way that can be walked is not the way. So in other words, the way is not a particular way. A name that can be named is not the name. It's not a particular name. It's not Islam. It's not Christianity. It's not Taoism. As Mahatma Gandhi was fond to say when he was asked, so what tradition are you? He said, well, I'm a Hindu. I'm a Buddhist. I'm a Taoist. I'm a Christian. I'm a Muslim. I'm a Jew. <laughs> In other words, kind of poking fun at the labels and poking fun at the particularity uh, that we create when we approach reality. Because in a strange, strange way, when we create that particularity, we obscure and preclude the real way, which is pluralistic, which doesn't have labels and titles and theologies and, and credos. Um, because what happens when we particularize those credos and theologies is we create an us-them, as we'll see in a moment. And when we create the us-them, we're actually moving in exactly the opposite direction that our hearts are inviting us to move. And so Lao Tzu says, a mind free of thought merged within itself beholds the essence of the Tao. Again, inviting us to a contemplative experience. When meditating, go deep, go deep into the heart. So Jesus, we know his primary message was love God and serve humanity. And Lao Tzu the same, be still, stillness reveals the secrets of eternity. I love uh, Bruce Lee's quote, be still water, be still water. And we know Bruce Lee was not, not um, always quiet. <laughs> he was very active in his life. And so Jesus taught the woman at the well, right? Worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And the, the greatest gift we have is to give that of your own trans, uh, transformation, self-transformation. So can we commit ourselves to that path of self-transformation? Because that is the great gift. It reveals, and you can see the water. I love the, the image there. The water looks like a butterfly. And again, the, the, the caterpillar little knows that someday it might just become, through that process, chrysalis process, a butterfly capable of flying. And that's the invitation, but it requires us to make choices. In the book, it tells us worship makes one increasingly like the being who is worshiped. So in so many ways, the book invites us to immerse ourselves in the stillness of our hearts, in worship and adoration, and gratefulness and awe before the creator. In another part, it says the sum and substance of his teaching, right, which is really important, was the worship of God in the service of humanity. Mm -hmm. And so Lao Tzu too says the sage serves. The sage has no mind of his own. He sees the needs of others. I am good to people who are good. I am also good to people who are not good. Because virtue, day, and now you're getting that word, is goodness. I have faith in people who are faithful. I also have faith in people who are not faithful. Because virtue, day, is faithfulness. Hmm? And I like to bring to my students kind of an awareness of trauma. Because it's often the case that people who are not good or are not faithful have been victims of trauma. And so as I tell them, the only possible response that we can have to people like that is to have faith in them and to feel compassion for the levels of trauma that they've experienced. And so Jesus helped the blind to see. He had compassion on them. And he helped heal the sick. What good will it be for a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? And so the passage that we find in the Urantia book in paper 131, again, is uh, from a human source. It's a wonderful book by a fellow named Hume. It's uh, the treasure, and you'll see this in the slide set, the treasure's house of the living religions. And it's really an admirable uh, translation. But there they were in Alexandria, and they were reading these texts. And here you have the creator of our universe reading uh, texts from other traditions. Again, I think inviting us 
to a pluralistic appreciation of the way in which truth manifests across the seas. And when we do that, again, we do nothing more nor less than amplify our own personal spiritual experience, which is what the book says is most important. So here's the quote from Hume, how pure and tranquil is the Supreme One, and yet how powerful and mighty, how deep and unfathomable this God of heaven is the honored ancestor of all things. And then from the book, we get how pure and still is the Supreme Being, how deep and unfathomable, as if the honored ancestor of all things. So this is, again, the text from the book. This is the comparison from the Revelation. All good works of true service come from the Supreme. And then we read in the book, you all know this quote, all true love is from God, and man receives the divine affection as he himself bestows this love upon his fellows, which sort of suggests an ordering of things, which is that we should connect, as Confucius says, how can the vehicle move without being connected to a source of power. We should connect with that source of power in contemplative worship, meditation, and prayer, receive that love, and then pass it along to our brothers and sisters with smiles, with service, with kindness, with patience. And again, the passage from the book, which you can read later, and the passage from the Revelation. So the Supreme creates all things in nature, nourishing them and in spirit, perfecting them. And it is a mystery how the Supreme fosters, protects, and perfects the creature without compelling him. He guides and directs, but without self-assertion. He ministers progression, but without domination. Wow, really amazing. And then we get from the book, paper 34, the spirit never drives, only leads. If you are a willing learner, if you want to attain spirit levels and re reach divine heights, if you sincerely desire to reach the eternal goal, then the divine spirit will gently and lovingly lead you along the pathway of sonship and spiritual progress. Every step you take must be one of willingness, intelligent and cheerful cooperation. The domination of the spirit is never tainted with coercion or compromised by compulsion. I just love this passage. And again, it reminds me that the thought adjuster who indwells each of you now is pre-personal. And pre-personal, I've come to realize is a synonym for grace, which means that the thought adjuster doesn't dominate our lives. It awaits our choices. It awaits our willingness, our humility, our curiosity, our sense of awe, as we open ourselves up to the gracious presence of God within. And as we do that, we go into partnership with God and thereby provide the thought adjuster with not just pre-personal prerogatives, but personal prerogatives. How lucky and how blessed we are and how graceful God is in his approach to each of us. So this is uh, the Urantia book or Jesus, and this is Lao Tzu. Relate yourself to every man as if you were in his place. Brotherly love would love your neighbor as you love yourself. And that would be an adequate fulfillment of the golden rule. And then Lao Tzu, recompense injury with kindness. Jesus, you shall return good for evil. Lao Tzu, if you love people, they will draw near you. You will have no difficulty in winning them. And then Jesus, my messengers must not strive with men, but be gentle toward all. So again, there's, there's a book called Jesus and Lao Tzu. Uh, it's a, written by a fellow named Aronson. It's part of a series. It's also Muhammad and Jesus and Buddha and Jesus. And they're really well done. And they compare these quotes. Um, and so I'm going to move forward here rather quickly to another quote here, which is, you cannot find the Supreme, neither can you go to a place where he is not. In other words, the Tao is everywhere. And then we read from the book in paper three, the omnipresence of God is in reality a part of his infinite nature. Space constitutes no barrier to deity. De God is in perfection and without limitation, discernibly present only on paradise and in the central universe. He is not thus observably present in the creations encircling Havona, for God has limited 
his direct and actual presence in recognition of the sovereignty and the divine prerogatives of the coordinate creators and rulers of the universes of time and space. Now, the reason I love this, again, is it's just another display of God's graciousness. How God limits himself. He steps back, just as the thought adjuster, pre-personal, steps back, awaiting the unfolding of the emergence of the supreme, the progress of the whole. Uh, and again, the, the humility and the, the meekness associated with this quality of divinity is beyond imagination. So again, Jesus and Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu says, always remember that God does not reward man for what he does, but for what he is. Therefore, should you extend help to your fellows without thought of reward? We call this in India, karma yoga. And Jesus would reiterate, in the kingdom, you must be righteous in order to do the work. In other words, you must connect with God in order to do the service. Many times did he repeat, be you therefore perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect. And then Lao Tzu, do good without thought of benefit to the self. And Jesus, lay not up your treasures in earth, but by your own selfish service, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So I'm going to move now to another section. Oh, by the way, this symbol, which you've all familiar with, you probably see it on skateboards mostly, but <laughs> the symbol of the, the yin and the yang, right? Uh, there's a wonderful book called The Tao of Physics by Fritjof Capra. And this symbol really is a beautiful illustration of the deity and unqualified absolutes, the primal relationship which Lao Tzu says is the inexhaustible fertile source of the universe. Well, that's what those absolutes are doing, both on the level of deity and unqualified. And then, thank goodness, we have the universal absolute, which gets the two together. And so we see that we live in a binary universe, right? And this is what Taoism uh, gives us the opportunity to see, positive and negative currents. And when you turn on your lights in whatever room you turn them on, it's not going to work unless you've got both sides of that current operational. And we live in a binary dualistic world in which there is this binary in everything we think, say, and do. And I, I ask my students this list, I, you, us, them, on, off, one, zero, superior, inferior, adult, child, masculine, feminine, healthy, sick, wealthy, poor, smart, dumb, um, and then uh, straight gay, uh, our culture tends to lean in which direction, Tim? To the left or to the right? Uh, to the left. Okay, I hope right. you all see that. I hope you all see that because it's true here. It's true here. Modern indigenous, white, black, develop, undeveloped. So we have this binary appreciation of reality, spirit, matter, in medieval theology, spirit was regarded as good and matter was regarded as evil. And we get the word matter from the Latin mater, which means mother, which means the feminine is evil. Hmm? And that's why so many women who like to garden wound up as witches on the stake. So again, you see the binaries of actual potential, right? The big slam, right, Tim, to, to a student is you have great potential, <laughs> so again, you see this dualistic way in which we view reality, our perspective, and how it creates a kind of us-them, and how it creates devastating consequences. So Lao Tzu tries to invite us to see how those energies are harmonized, how those binaries, how those dualities can be harmonized through our contemplative practice. And he says, we know beauty because there is ugly. We know good because there is evil. And again, he's referring to the potential for ugliness, the potential for evil. He is not a dualist in the sense that he thinks there is as much ugliness in the universe as there is beauty or as much evil, that these are values that must be chosen. Lao Tzu understood that clearly. So again, the sage... Uh, understands that we are biologically grounded as we learn in the Arantia book and that we have a divine destiny. And so here was a friend of my grandmother's, Albert Schweitzer. The sage has no mind of his own. He was the greatest musician, 
philosopher, theologian in Europe. He picked up, got his degree in medicine and went to Africa and everybody thought him crazy. And when he was asked, why did you do this? He said, because it is needed. Same thing of Teresa of Calcutta, same thing of Jane Goodall. And so the sage is one who shares. The sage's way of relating to others is to share everything, everything. And as this sage said, if you want to be happy, practice compassion. If you want others to be happy, practice compassion. And he said, the real revolution is compassion, because as I said at the beginning, compassion is the linchpin between living love and hope. So virtue uh, consists of three treasures, humility, simplicity, and love. We're not going to go into great detail, uh, but I am taking up short, Tim, when I read this one to my students. Those who know don't lecture. Those who lecture don't know. And so uh, I really try to make it as much conversation as anything <laughs> and tell them I probably should just go home and we should all meditate for the next uh, 12 weeks because <laughs> that probably would do more good than anything else. So the last principle is Wei Wu Wei, which is following the path of least resistance, which is to say there's an energy. And I tell my students that philosophy is all about energy, physical, mental, and spiritual. And it's about learning how to surf that energy, how to follow the path of least resistance or what we call flow. And so you see the, the smile on her face, the bliss in her face. She's in door number two. And this is what happens when we walk into the gate of wonder, of awe, of numinosity. And as Lao Tzu says, without that, there will be disaster personally, and there will be disaster collectively. And I think we can all observe that. I love this slide. I grew up on a surfboard in San Diego, so I, I love the image of surfing. So the Shen Tzu on the path to the Tao flows without forcing, leaving no space for disaster. The silent song of the Tao is the ultimate music. Lao Tzu says the infinite delicacy of Tao is the consummate nourishment. Returning to eternal silence is returning to peace. Returning to peace, the world reharmonizes. And I think it's about time. So try a little Tao. You might, might just like it. May you be blessed by the flow. Uh, thank you very much, guards. It's very uh, uh, enlightening and interesting. Um, do I see uh, Patricia? Hey, Patty. Why only 20 minutes? We have more time than anything in the universe. <laughs> Patty, you are spot on. <laughs> I, I always actually to my students, and you may know, understand this, to my students, I start with three minutes and then I tell them, why don't you expand it to five minutes and then 10 minutes. And then eventually I say 20 minutes because 20 minutes, I think many of the masters, my, my uh, teacher, Thomas Keating said, is a good equation uh, first thing in the morning and then in the evening before you eat dinner. Um, and I found it to be very good. But then Patty, as you say, I take what I call retreats with God. So I go off and um, I take a week of, of grand silence and I do a round. I do a round where I worship. I do a little breathing. I do some exercises, usually uh, yoga. And then I worship again and I keep doing it. And you keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper. So I, I really recommend a vacation with God. It's a, it's a lovely experience and your point is well taken, but, but a lot of people have obligations and so Again, there's a balance between rest and activity, between worship and service. And again, I will just underscore, there are really only three principles. Um, and they align with three principles that I think Jesus taught. The first principle is, for Jesus, was the fatherhood of God. The first principle for Lao Tzu was the Tao, which in chapter 25, he says, it's something great, it's something mysterious. I don't know what to call it. Right, he didn't have he didn't have access to the mind of Jesus. He didn't have access to the fifth epic revelation. He said, "Let's just call it the way, the Tao." Um, so that's the first principle. And the second principle is day, which is virtue, which is how do we carry the energy of the Tao into our lives and out into our world? 
And so for Jesus, that was service. So every moment of our lives is a moment of opportunity to serve. And at the very least, to smile. As we say with mirror neurons, right? Even if the person doesn't smile back, at least we've loosened their facial muscles. So maybe the next person will cause them to smile. So that's the second principle, which is service or virtue, which is, and this is an important point, which is it's an infused virtue. It's not something you learn from your parents. It's not something you read from a book. It's not something even that you get out of a lecture in the classroom. It is something that is infused as a result of your contemplative practice. So virtue or day is really something that emerges as a result of humbling yourself before the reality of the divine. And when we humble ourselves, as we're taught in the Beatitudes, what emerges is a quality of curiosity. And that quality of curiosity is not particular to any particular path. It is pluralistic. It's curiosity about everything. I remember, as some of you may have done, saying to a person, well, once you got the Arantia book, you don't need any more books. Well, ha, 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 right? <laughs> That's why I'm wearing these glasses, right? So again, the, the, the infused, and this was in medieval theology, Thomas Aquinas talked about infused theology, which has been missed by many people, especially the systematic theologians which is that it is a function of our contemplative experience. And as Aquinas, who wrote 64 volumes, said after he had his mystical experience, all those volumes are just so much dust compared to what he had just experienced. And the last principle is Wei Wu Wei, which is the path of least resistance, which in the lingo of Jesus is the will of God. And when you're following the will of God, yes, there will be challenges. Yes, there will be things that emerge, but it is the path of least resistance. And you are sustained in following the will of God, as we know from the revelation by our angels, by the indwelling presence. And so those three principles are really the sum and substance of both Jesus and Lao Tzu. And the surfing metaphor, I hope you enjoyed, right? I'm enjoying the surfing metaphor. I find myself on a beach here in uh, north of Puerto Vallarta. You know, you talked about going on vacation with God, and I feel like this for me has been bringing God into my vacation. So I just wanted to, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to thank you so much, and I'm really glad to be um, in this group this morning or, or this afternoon. Thank you very much, Ken. Yeah, my wife and I, we we take our vacations in Mexico, and there's a reason. Um, the Spanish culture has such a huge heart, grande corazón. And I'm always inspired when I'm in Mexico by the quality of kindness and patience and, and service and just divinity that we experience when we're down there. So enjoy your time in Puerto Vallarta. Yeah. Well, that has been my experience as well. I actually, and I actually lived in Mexico and Yucatan for 10 years and the people are wonderful. And, you know, God is a, is a very integral part of their lives and, and it shows, it comes through in the way that they smile and the way that they serve uh, and laugh. And, and it's, it's a wonderful cultural experience. And yes, and, and I love all the churches and the, you know, the way that they decorate them. It just, all exudes the love that they have for uh, for God and for Jesus. And yeah, we always go to the open air cathedral there in Cancun when we're there, and it's lovely. and And it was right near Yucatan that a meteor, um, a little bit bigger than this, in fact, it was the size of Manhattan, hit near the Yucatan <laughs> Peninsula, and it threw up a dust cloud which killed all the dinosaurs and allowed little tiny creatures called mammals to emerge from their holes and look around and say, I don't see a T-Rex, do you? <laughs> and, and, and they got bigger and bigger and bigger. And here we are, and that was the Cenozoic period. Uh, and what I wanna say is that we've been hit by another meteor. And that as Thomas Berry, my teacher suggests, we are moving from the Cenozoic to the Ecozoic. And that meteor was in some fashion could be metaphorized as the coronavirus. 
And a lot of people still don't get the metaphor, the symbolic aspect of the virus. But that virus was the beginning of a, of a sea change on the planet. And I think this revelation is here to help people appreciate the nature of that sea change. And so it was literally a meteor from within the earth that came up rather than a meteor from outer space. And I think many of you understand what I'm saying is that we're in the midst of that sea change and we are pioneers. And a lot of people don't get what we're saying right now. I'm advocating for restorative justice in the state of Nevada and both sides of the aisle are saying no. And I'm going, really? You'd rather throw that 14 year old into prison um, and basically destroy his life and his potential for exhibiting divine qualities than moving him through a restorative circle process? And they say yes. Mm -hmm. so again, there's we're, we're in the midst of a sea change and a shift. And so I'm looking over at Esther. Esther, welcome. Okay, good. Uh, hi, God. Uh, my question is um, regarding this uh, meditation, because I know you have lots of uh, uh, experience for the meditation. And from the uh, light, a uh, course of light, and we always said we need to have a positive, um, how to say, thinking uh, during the meditation. Of course, now I didn't do that anymore. And I also searched that uh, people have different. Uh, way and uh, some people said uh, you need to empty your mind and when you observe the mind calm and you let it go or you you just um, notice that you we, we should empty our mind so um could you share a little bit uh, your experience uh, what should be the a better way um to do the meditation because i might still try different things and uh, uh yeah um, I would like to go to a little bit deeper uh, in that way. <laughs> it's such an excellent question. And Esther, thank you for asking it. And what Lao Tzu and I think Jesus would agree is that within our time meditation, there is a space for thinking, positive mm -hmm. thoughts. But there's also a space for just listening. Mm -hmm. And I think listening is really the appropriate metaphor, which is, I'm sure, Esther, you've been in a, a, a conversation with somebody where, you know, they were saying something, but your mind was going, and <laughs> you were thinking about what you were going to say to them, and you weren't <laughs> really listening to what they were saying. <laughs> and, and so meditation and worship is really listening to the still small voice within ourselves. And what we say in, in meditation practice is that what we do is we sort of open up with a sense and awareness of that divine presence within ourselves. And then we use either our breath or a sacred word. So I have two words, glory be. And it kind of allows me to come back to center. Mm -hmm. And then I notice my mind starts to think again, right? Which is what the mind naturally does. And it's mm -hmm. a natural part of meditation and it's okay. But then when I notice my mind is thinking, right, about lunch or this, or that, I very gently bring that word or the breath, mm -hmm. allow me to center. And what we create is a space in awareness. And what I tell my students, you know, who are musicians, the space between the notes is as important as the notes. Mm -hmm. And a real musician knows how to articulate the space as well as they know how to articulate the notes mm -hmm. and so what emerges very spontaneously and naturally is that that space grows and grows and within the context of that space the still small voice is allowed to speak metaphorically which is that infusion of divine presence which causes as jesus says worship makes one increasingly like the being who is worshiped so it allows if you will that transformation from uh, from the caterpillar to the butterfly to take place in a very natural place. And so what I tell my students is when you go to sleep at night, you don't consciously say, okay, well, I'm asleep and I'm going to stay asleep. No, 
you just naturally gravitate your body naturally to that place of deep sleep. And in the context of that deep sleep, you have dreams. So rapid eye movement, you have dreams. So there's an alternation when we're unconscious at night between that deep sleep and the dreams, that, that resting state and that activity. And that's the same thing that occurs in worship and meditation, that okay. there will be moments where we're thinking, oh, I just want to send a blessing and a, a wishing of goodwill to Esther and to Vicky and to my friends, to Patty and to Tim and to Joanne. And then I'll enter into that space of silence, which is really just saying to God, I want to hear your voice. I really want to know you. I really want to experience your love so I can take that living love out into the world with a quality of compassion and create an aspiration of hope in the people that I meet. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answer. And that made me uh, more conf confidence because I always struggled that I couldn't put this positive thinking and always thinking about because I'm more relaxed and because we said be still and you have the space so that you can hear the voice. This is more my way. So your answer really confirmed that I'm going to the right direction. So because I'm thinking, oh, I cannot be positive. I just relax and uh, so that I can hear some, some, yeah, something will come to. <laughs> yeah, come to it, it's as simple, Esther, as imagine being with your very, very best friend. And when you're with your very, very best friend, you are relaxed, mm -hmm. you are breathing easily. You are really interested to hear what's going on. I was with a family yesterday in Southern California, and we just had gales of laughter and fun, and we were listening deeply to each other, and it was just a joy. It was it was worshipful. Yeah. And that's what a little bit, just a little bit of what we experience when we're in worship with God, which opens the gate of wonder, the gate of awe, the gate of mystery. Patricia has it. Hand up again. Well, I, I don't mean to dominate, but um, I'm I'm working on one of the ideas that Jesus um, gave us, and that is of self control. Looking at the four elements that that the Urantia book states of anger, deceit, um, anger, deceit, greed, and pride, and that these really have to be dealt with, and if you can deal with them. When you do deal with them, you exhibit, you feel you are controlling yourself. And that makes me think of the lack of parameters that you develop when we go to the mansion worlds and we are free because we are self-controlled. Um, does Leo see comment? I mean, do we have comments of, of self-control and the comparisons that you do? Yeah, it's a great, great question, Patty. And again, you know, I think what Jesus and Lao Tzu would agree with, say, both of them say it, is that we don't will those things away. It's the story, the Cherokee story of the good wolf and the bad wolf. It's the question of which wolf do you feed? And so, you know, in the Beatitude, Jesus says, you know, first, number one, first button on the shirt, if you do the first button, everything goes down pretty well. First button on the shirt is humility, which is surrendering ourselves to the presence and action of God within. And when we do that, it leads to the second button, which is blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, which is basically turning on the light of curiosity, of wonder, of awe, out of that experience of surrender. And when we do that, it leads to the third beatitude, which creates a capacity for kindness and patience with everyone around us. So we're literally beginning with that listening as Esther and I were talking about, and that infusion of capacity to engage in wonder and awe, leading to kindness and patience. And the last piece of the first four Beatitudes is sincerity, which means say what you mean, mean what you say and follow through. So if you're a student of this revelation, then follow through. And what does follow through mean? It means take that divine appointment, go out and find some kind of way in which to serve, as simple as just smiling at people. So I, I, 
I'll finish with a, a story. I have a friend, Emma Sapala, who teaches the happiness class at Stanford. And she had a student and they were talking about mirror neurons and they were talking about how when I smile, Patty, you smile. <laughs> and our brain is literally, and it's probably next to the discovery of DNA, the most important biological discovery because it opens us to the realization of the connection of the brain and the heart, heart, mind, trust. And it opens us to the realization that we have each of us a huge capacity to be a change maker in our world. So she was teaching this course on, and she was talking about mirror neurons. And one of her students went back to the dormitory where there was a lady who was goth. I think you all understand goth. She was dressed in black and she had black makeup. And whenever this student would smile at her, you know, trying to exercise those mirror neurons, the, 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 the goth student would scowl. Mm, mm, mm. And, and, and she did this period, you know, quite often as she would see her in the hallway or in the dining room. And again, she get the scowl, but she said, she went to Emma after two weeks. She said, after, after two weeks, the lady came up to me and said, thank you for seeing me. So that story for me illustrates that most people, as Jesus and Lao Tzu understood, live behind a cloud of fear, anxiety, and anger, which has been exacerbated by a quality of trauma. And that that cloud precludes us from experiencing the sun. And as we all know, right, you're up in, I think, the Northwest, Patty, that uh, the clouds are just a few wisps of water. The sun is the reality. And so we have the opportunity, right, to allow, if you will, a dispersion of those clouds by choosing door number two. And so again, it is a conscious choice. And as students of this revelation, this world is in dire need of what you have in your laps, of what you have in your heart, and what you have in your mind. So thank you for that question. I've seen the, the most horrible people on the streets with these looks on their faces. And I smile at them. And they smile back. And it just changes everything. Yeah. <laughs> And no, remember, no. even if they don't smile back, you've at least loosened the facial muscles. So the next person that smiles is going to get that smile. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Linda, and I want to thank you for allowing me to join you today. And uh, as you were speaking about the link between the heart and the mind, I think one of the best books I've read about that is Biology of Belief. Yes. And it yes. really drives it in. To, it's definitely a linkage there. Yes, there. And in fact, that's a great uh, point, Linda. And in fact, there was a a book written by Paul Pearsall, a neuroimmunologist, called "The Heart's Code," which I recommend, which is the story of heart transplant patients. So, again, eight year old gets nine year old girl's heart who is murdered. Eight year old starts to have nightmares. Eight year old's mother takes the eight year old to a psychologist. Psychologist says, "Not me." They go to CSI and the forensic right. artist draws the picture of the nightmares. And it's a relative of the nine-year-old. The detectives take the eight-year-old out to the scene of the murder. And she's able to locate the murder weapon upon which there are prints related to the image on the picture. And the fellow is convicted based on the eight-year-old's testimony. So. This is a powerful illustration that the heart is more than just a blood pumping mechanism and that Jesus meant it and Lao Tzu meant it when they said with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. You know, God, that was just so fascinating about the heart's code because they talk about like genetic memory and, you know, I wonder if a lot of that resides in the heart. Well, uh, the book that was mentioned, all right, Biology of Belief, it's not just the heart, it's the kidney, it's the liver, it's it's all, everything inside your body, the skin everywhere. Wow. Carries, carries memory. And 
again, what mindfulness and worship and meditation allows us is just to be awestruck by this vehicle that we get to live in. It's awesome. It's awesome. It really is. The whole thing is awesome. And how could you not stop stop giggling when you realize the awesomeness of it all? Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I did. I don't know if anybody heard of Vipassana, Vipassana meditation. And yeah. what that does is um, you go in for it. It's um, but you go for 10 days and you don't look at anyone. You don't talk. And you do this meditation where you go through your body inch by inch. You first focus in your mind so you can do that. And then you do that. And it's like taking a, a mental shower guard where after 10 days, and I've done lots of those, uh, you don't feel every little twinge of anger and fear. And that's it's uh, that was why Buddha put that together so that you could do that. It's not yeah. easy, but it's available. They're everywhere. I mean, they're in all the big cities and things. It actually becomes easier with practice, right, Jan? Yes. And uh, I've been to Spirit Rock many times, uh, Jack Cornfield, and again, this vacation with God, I highly recommend it. I used to come back, I was a CPA, and I come back and they said, you did what with your vacation time? <laughs> it's like, yeah, and if you really understood how wonderful it is, you'd do it too. <laughs> And the Vipassana is just the meditation following the breath. When you notice your thinking, you come very gently back to your breath. And uh, as Thich Nhat Hanh says, you know, this is, the breath is everything, right? <laughs> it's, again, that duality, in-breath, out-breath, in-breath, out-breath. Um, and so, yeah. Going back to the body, is it in the Bible or in the Urantia book where it's the parts of the body are called members. That's Paul, and he's talking about the church. And well, members have memory. So your heart, your lungs, their yeah. knees, yeah. your feet. I talk to mine all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so guard vipassana meditation that I did was not just watching your thoughts. It was... Um, training your mind to go through your body and be aware aware of your skin or you never didn't do that you went through your body and you stayed and you felt a sensation okay um it takes how much uh time to make a brain synapse second thought that's why it says don't take a second thought so within that time you move through it you detach by doing that from your memories and yet it's a constancy go through your body over hour after hour to doing that it's not hard it's what you do (laughs) and that way you detach the memories yeah the second noble truth in buddhism is attachment which is the source of suffering and so when we attach ourselves too closely to our memories we create the capacity for more fear and anxiety and anger and so Vipassana and worship and all of these techniques allow us to detach and recognize that we are not our thoughts. We are not our memories. They're part of our experience, which is of value, but that's not who we are. We're not defined by them. So um, I took, I recommend you take the, what's called the A-score. How many of you are familiar? Raise your hand with the A-score. It's the adverse childhood experiences. It's only 10 questions. And uh, I was a four, which is pretty high in the ACE world. Um, But I will say, and I have three siblings, uh, that meditation, I wouldn't be here without meditation, without the Urantia revelation, without all of you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Gard. It's really been... uh, obviously educational, but eye-opening too. And, you know, you put up that list with all the things on the left and the right. And 
we're so trained to, to, to pick that one side, right? And we're, we're, we want to jump there. And you just gave us a marvelous window into, into both sides. And the, like you said, the humility to be open to these, to these new, you know, the papers and the books are being written right now on, on these connections and how we can get back to them probably or understand them a little bit. So it's, 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 it's really, really fantastic. 